Right brollies, let's get back into mechanical keyboards with the Mons Geek M2. I've always wanted to review a full-sized or at least a keyboard with a proper numpad since the mechanical keyboard market space is now saturated with compact form factors. There are a ton of full-size keyboards from mainstream brands but most are pre-built with little to no customization options. And if you think about it, I think you can only count on your fingers the options for customizable keyboards with a numpad, one of which is the Mons Geek M2. An affordable customizable keyboard featuring a compact 1800 layout, full aluminum chassis, pretty much all the sound dampening foam you'll ever need, hot swappable self-facing sockets, and most importantly, QMK compatible. I think this is one of the best budget options if you really need a numpad. In this video, I'll share with you its constructions and the different configurations that you can do to tailor with your sound and feel preference as it is quite versatile. With that being said, let's get into it. Full disclaimer, this is not a sponsored video, but Mons Geek did send the M2 as a review sample. As for the switches, I bought a couple of Aqua CS Wine Reds last year that I still haven't used. And finally, for the keycap set, Zion Studios PH sent a set of Perry Candy themed keycaps before, and I think it's a perfect match for this keyboard. Now, the packaging for the Mons Geek M2 is a basic block box with minimal branding. Inside the box, we have a foam cover, the Mons Geek M2 itself, and a bunch of accessories. First, we have a sort of tape material for the popular tape mod, and this is definitely a well-appreciated bonus. We also have the user manual written in different languages. Aside from the extra tape, we also have some extra Teflon pads should you choose to do the popular force break mod. We'll do both of these mods later and I'll share with you a sound test comparison. We also have these rubber pads but to be honest, I have no idea what is this for. Aside from that, we also have a non-braided white coiled cable, the screws for the stabilizers and some extra case screws and the screw-in stabilizers. We even have a plastic dust cover here which is awesome. Now at first look and touch, the Mons Geek M2 resembles its Aqua mod brothers and sisters featuring a full CNC aluminum chassis, polycarbonate plate, self-facing hot swappable sockets, and a bunch of sound dampening foam inside. It is solidly built with pretty much no flex whatsoever and weighs around 2 kilograms. The quality is outstanding for such an affordable keyboard with curved corners and chamfered edges. I also appreciate the 1800 layout with a good amount of partition between its main key clusters making transitioning to this layout easier than let's say the cramped layout of the new Halo 96 which by the way you can watch my review here. Now looking from the top, aside from those things that I've already mentioned, we also have three LED indicators right here. Now flipping it at the bottom, we have four rubber feet, a debossed logo and badge here at the center, and the easy to access screws around the edges. Going back to the front side, as you can tell, it features a high profile case design, hiding the switches for a cleaner look. And then looking at the back side, we have a taller profile here for the slanted ergonomic form factor. We also have the USB Type-C port here with a substantial cutout around it. And finally, looking at its side, we have a silver accent piece also made out of aluminum. I've read that Mons Geek is also planning on selling this separately in different colors, which is nice. Now, with the unboxing and parts overview out of the way, let's tear this keyboard apart and see what we can do in terms of customization. Like the Aqua Mod Series DIY kits, the Mons Geek lineup is equally easy to tear apart and is definitely beginner friendly. All you have to do is remove the screws around the edges, either using the included Allen screw or your own tool make sure to keep in mind the difference in length. After that, you can simply lift the top cover like so. Next, lift the PCB and plate combo gently so as to not damage the cable connecting the PCB to the USB Type-C port. This is just a wired mode keyboard so we don't have a battery here. As you can see, this is a gasket mount keyboard and the silicon gaskets are located on the plate. Now right here, we have the bottom case with a separate USB Type-C port. We also have a PET insulation layer here for extra protection. As I pointed out earlier, Mons Geek is planning on selling these accent pieces separately and they are fairly easy to remove. The gaskets on this keyboard are made out of silicone material which while flexible is harder than the other commonly used material which is porn foam. Now which is better will highly depend on your preference. Personally, I like porn gaskets more than silicone. We also have a sort of sponge bottom case foam here and a custom foam that is pretty similar to Poron with pre-cut holes to fit flush into the back of the PCB. Speaking of the PCB, the hot swap sockets are made by Kill, which in my experience is fairly durable and the thickness of the PCB is around 1.6mm. Now if you need to access the PCB, especially for installing the screw-in stabilizers, all you need to do is remove the screws that hold the PCB in plate together. As you can see here, the PCB is compatible with QMK and was manufactured just last December. It features south-facing sockets with south-facing surface mounted LEDs. Next, we have the switch pad made out of IXPE foam with pre-cut holes for the switches. 
Then we have the plate foam that is similar to the custom bottom case foam. And lastly, we have the polycarbonate plate which is very flexible. All in all, we pretty much have all the most common sound dampening materials any enthusiast is looking for on a custom mechanical keyboard and you can definitely mix and match and experiment with different types of build to tailor to your personal sound and feel preference. Now for our first build, we're going to keep it in its out of the box configuration with the Unlube stock stabilizers. Speaking of the stock stabilizers, they come unassembled but are already pre-clipped. So essentially, all you need to do is lube it or perform your preferred tuning method. Now, installing the stabilizers on the PCB is pretty easy. Just insert the clips on the bigger holes, line them up, and secure them with screws. And there you go. Just don't forget to place the PE foam first unless you don't want to use it. Now, rebuilding the keyboard back is equally easy. Just reverse the process we did earlier. As for the switches, what I have here is the Aqua CS Wine Red, which is linear and has an actuation force of around 43 grams. It has a standard total travel distance of around 4 mm but has a slightly shorter pre-travel of around 1.9 mm. It is hand lubed using Crytox GPL105 and GPL205 grade 0. Now, two 45-piece boxes aren't enough to fill an 1800 layout, so I'll just put some KTT grapefruit that I got from Squishy Types. I'll put some links below if you're interested. For the keycaps, I'm going to use this Berry Candy keycap set from Zion Studios PH designed by Pandalisa. Unfortunately, this is still currently in the IC stage, but hopefully they push through as I think it is pretty cute. Let me know in the comments below what you think about this keycap set. You can opt for a cleaner look or use cute novelties here. Alright, so now here's a quick sound test for the out of the box configuration. For our next build, we're going to loop the stabilizers and add the included tape. As for modding the stabilizers, I decided to use both the stabilizer lube and switch lube from Science Studios PH. The stabilizer lube is essentially the same as the Crytox XHT BDZ thick lube, while the switch lube is basically the same as the Crytox 205 grade 0. This is the first time I'm doing this, just out of curiosity, but I decided to use the switch lube for the housing and the stem and use the thicker stabilizer lube for the wire. In theory, the thicker lube should provide a similar effect to a dielectric lube and should suffice without the need to add any other material like a band-aid or microport tape. While the thinner lube should prevent the stem from being too mushy or sticky and I think it worked out pretty well. It's not as good as my preferred method which is the microport tape around the wire mod but it's close and is easier to do. Here's a quick sound test. Now, adding the included tape alongside the PCB foam made the PCB and plate combo quite thick, so I decided to remove the sponge bottom case foam. And here's a sound test with both the PE foam and tape mod, but without the sponge bottom case foam. This combination of tape and PE foam materials acts as a sort of filter and makes the sound signature of the keyboard more poppy and marbly. However, I can definitely hear a significant amount of pinging or metallic sound with this build. Let me know in the comments below if you can hear that too. Now for our third and final build, we're going to remove both the tape and PE foam and use the included Teflon pads to do a force break mod. This should provide a substantial cushion between the top and bottom aluminum casing and eliminate or at least reduce the pinging sound. I also added back the bottom sponge foam. 
Removing both the tape and PE foam should give us the real sound signature of this keyboard along with its switches and keycaps without any filter aside from the reverb reducing foams. I decided to put all the Teflon pads around the screw holes on both the top and bottom casing and a couple on the accent piece. Here's a sound test for the force brake mod without the PE foam and tape. As you've heard, the pinging sound is completely gone, which is absolutely amazing, and the sound signature even without the PE foam and tape is not bad either. Honestly, this is my favorite version of this keyboard. Overall, I learned a lot from this keyboard and expanded my knowledge about other configurations that you can do on a mechanical keyboard. Now, here's a full sound test for you guys. Unfortunately, I recorded this stock configuration on a different day, while both the modded versions were recorded on the same day, so you may hear a slight variation compared to this stock sound test. By the way, I noticed that a lot of you guys, my viewers, are not yet subscribed. So if you find my videos helpful or at least informative, a new subscriber will mean a lot to me. So click that red button and hit that bell notification as well so you won't miss out. Thank you. Now moving to the other details about this keyboard, just for the completeness of this review, I'll pop the user manual on the screen so that you can have an idea about its functionalities. Essentially, we have shortcuts for both Windows and Mac OS and some secondary layers for things like insert, print screen, calculator, and multimedia. You can even swap WASD with the arrow keys. You can also see here the key combinations for the lighting effects, which I'll show you right now. In terms of software, it is QMK and VIA compatible, which is pretty awesome, and they have all the JSON files available to download from their website. Using the VIA tool, we can test the NKRO performance, which in this case is up to 6 keys at the same time. I'm not sure if there is a key combination to toggle full NKRO, but I can seem to find one, not even on the user manual. So yeah, only up to 6 keys at least. Now, I'm not going to dive deep into this VIA software, but essentially, what you can do here is you can change a key function to a different one like other basic keys, media shortcuts, macro recordings, layers, you get the idea. And what's good here is that it supports macro recording, which other VIA compatible boards surprisingly doesn't depending on the firmware version. So yeah, if you have the time to tinker with it, you can customize this keyboard to your heart's content. Alright, so to conclude, what I like about the Mons Geek M2 is the build quality and the amount of customization you can do at such an affordable price point. Granted, this purple variant is a bit more pricey at around 116 US dollars, but if you choose either the black or silver variant, which is just around 110 US dollars, you'll get a pretty solid and beginner friendly keyboard and it's a good starting point for getting your feet wet into this hobby, especially if you're not yet ready to let go of the numpad. Otherwise, the M1 is a better option overall with the more compact form factor and a volume knob and is cheaper than the M2. And there you have it, guys. Thank you for watching. Thanks to Monsgeek for sending this in. 
you can get this using the link below. If you appreciate this video, please consider subscribing to help me sustain and grow this channel. Thank you and see you next time. Have a great day guys, you're awesome.